Hello and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003, offering up fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now the ever-popular Saltwater Podcast Series. Um, In the Saltwater Podcast Series, we talk to our guides and captains from up and down the coast, asking them to share their insights on how to catch more fish more often. However, I would say the true goal isn't just more fish more often, but just to get more people out on the water more often, spending more time with family and friends on the water. Um, This episode is titled Catching Summer Sheep's Head, and it's going to be featuring Captain Luke Moser of Coastline Charters, Coastline Charters operating out of the Wrightsville Beach and Carolina Beach area. And we're going to cover such topics as where to fish, how to fish, different rigs, different baits. Um, before I get to Luke, though, I want to introduce my co-host as I'm joined every week. Uh, please uh, please welcome on Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Sorry oh, I stuttered there a little bit, Billy. Uh, <laughs> I know who I'm talking to. Uh, who's that guy's I'm name? I'm not nervous. Just call me the other guy, please. I'm not quite sure why. I've already established this. That's all right. I won't hold it against you. You've been doing good, man? I have. I've been, been doing good. Doing any fishing? Yeah. A little? Yeah, man. I, I went, too. I, I went with a friend of mine a couple weeks ago, and can't wait for flounder season. That's all i got to say about that. <laughs> it's good. Um, that is the theme. I think a lot of people are finding flounder and wishing they could put them in the cooler and not release them back into the water. Yeah. And man. you did release them back into the water. Maybe. No. Yeah, we did. <laughs> uh, we were in South Carolina. <laughs> I've seen a lot of those posts, like, thanks, South Carolina, for this five-pound flounder. I'm like, sure. <laughs> South Carolina. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're coming from South Carolina today, aren't we? Yes. Coming We're right broadcasting. From, <laughs> broadcasting from South Carolina. <laughs> got this flounder right here in the cooler. <laughs> oh, man. Well, really appreciate everybody watching, everybody listening to our, our podcast. Uh, just a little reminder of how to do that. Uh, it, we're available on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Play Music, and also you can watch us on YouTube. And it's really important that if you enjoy the show, make sure you like, share, hit the little subscribe button and the bell to make sure you get notified every time that we are on the air, every time we produce something new. Um, and it helps us out as well. Comment, like. Uh, algorithms love all that stuff so we like absolutely. the comments i mean we we read every comment so we we notice you when you subscribe and we read every comment please keep them coming all four of them so far no. <laughs> <laughs> well and and just so you guys know this is uh made possible by marine warehouse center here in wilmington north carolina and where is their other location saint not saint john am i saying that right i'm saying that wrong it's john's island john's island yeah, South Carolina. that's where it is i always get that wrong so anyway here's a little message from those guys at Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. That is a multi-talented crew over there, man. They got everything. Boats and service. They do it all. They pretty, do. Pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. I'll tell you what else is pretty impressive. The sheep's head right here with Kirk Truesdale. I think I said that right. With a 21-inch sheep's head caught in the lower Cape Fear River around Southport area. Thanks for submitting that picture, Kirk. And if you want to uh, be featured or a chance to be featured here on the show, make sure you submit your pictures. Fish Post has traditionally always loved photos. And also submit your videos, too. We'd love to share those on Instagram as well. I know there's a lot of good fighting videos out there, people fighting fish. Just make sure we can see the fish. I hate those ones where, I would you, love to where you watch it for like two minutes and they never show the fish. And I'm like, oh, man. Well, I'll tell you what, man. We... <laughs> Here at Fisherman's Post, man, we never complain about getting too many fish photos. And so we have, through the years, tried to coach people, at, you know, the best photo to, for their best chance to get in. And we say, hey, we love photos on the water. We like blue in the background. We don't like a whole bunch of catch out on the dock, you know, on the front of the boat. We'd rather have people holding up a couple of fish. And so if I were to guide you on videos, because I would love for that to catch on, more video submissions, one minute or less, you know. What? Yeah, that'd like, be good. One yeah. minute or less is ideal and, man, I would love for that to get steam. Yeah. I would love to start seeing some videos come in. And really a good chance if you attach a Venmo $5 to me. No, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> Gary doesn't know what Venmo is. It's good. <laughs> huh? So, Billy, this is usually when I say, now look, when, when Luke's done talking, I'm going to ask right. you for Billy's best takeaway. But before I remind you about Billy's best takeaway, mm. as I was watching that Marine Warehouse ad, it reminded me. Watching Emmett talk, it reminded me. And this isn't a little known fact about, uh, about Emmett. I'm going in a different direction. Oh. Oh. I'm going in I'm a, a little true sad. Fault. I'm, I'm going in sad. a true false direction. Okay, here we go. True false. Emmett is the name of a town in North Carolina. Uh, our guest is shaking his head yes, so I'm going to say I'm going with him. I'm going yes. I hope our guest knows more about <laughs> Sheep's Head than he does towns in North Carolina because I couldn't find one. I found one in uh, Idaho. Now, I'm Google searching, <laughs> and I admitted I didn't do my homework in advance, so I was rushing oh, before man. this show, but I found... No Emmett in North Carolina, but I did find an Emmett in Idaho. Oh man! So this uh, this podcast episode, since Luke couldn't help me there, <laughs> mine just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> but this doesn't get you out of Billy's right. best takeaway. Remember, I want to know what Luke here says that sticks with you more than others. I'm going to be ready. All right, let's let's get this thing moving. Hello, Luke Moser. Hello, Captain Luke Moser of Coastline Charters out of the Riceville Beach, Carolina Beach area. And before we move into the material about catching summer sheep's head, where to fish, how to fish, rigs, and bait, please tell my people why they should even listen any further. Why should they listen to what you have to say about sheep's head? Uh, Gary, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, I appreciate, appreciate you having me out here. Um, you know, as far as the sheep's head go, um, you know, I guess I'm more speaking for myself. It's just, you know, when I go to these places and do this sheep's head fishing, I don't see very many people that that practice it um or you know not successfully um you know not to not to pick on anybody but there's a lot of days you know when i'm on the water and i am sheep's head fishing um 90 percent of the time i'm by myself um and you know the people that are around me you know they're quite often asking me what are you doing differently and you know i'll give them a tip here and there but um that would be the thing that i could say is just you know just time on the water and, and actually practicing sheep's head fishing um you know, versus just going out and trying it once a year, um, you know, it's it's kind of hard to be successful with it like that. Um, I like that answer. I especially like it because I'm going to go sheep's head fishing with you soon. Yep. All right. Before we get into the primary content, two questions for you. And actually, I went more with the true fault scenario with you too, Ooh. Luke Moser. So you got a 50% chance. Sheep's head Bay, the sheep's head Bay section of New York City was named after the sheep's head fish. True, false. Well, Billy's uh, shaking his head true, so <laughs> let's go with true. I hope Billy knows more about podcasts. <laughs> no, that's false. Actually, it's true. You got the answer right. Billy advised you correctly. Gold star, Billy. Yes, that's right, man. I'm going to give myself a hand clap. <laughs> that's cute. True, false. And this is it. Then we're going to move into primary contact. It's been suggested suggested that the sheep's head got its name because its teeth looks like that of a sheep's teeth. I would go along with that. And that is true, too. Oh, right. So I had three true faults. No, wait. My first one was false. Never mind. Hey, it's all about structure. Yep. It's all about where to fish. I mean, most fishing can often be about where to fish. But for sheep's head, I believe you set me up to talk about structure. So talk to me first, because people love that discussion, where to fish for sheep's head. Yep. Um, you know, Gary, the, the easiest thing I, I do, um, you know, personally is, you know, I, there's so many different types, types of structure, especially around Wrightsville Beach. And I mean, this will, you know, play true to, you know, any saltwater area. Um, you know, you've got, you've got boat docks, you've got bridges, you know, you've got oyster bars, you know, there's, there's lots of structure, you know, up and down the, the ICW where you can find these fish. Um, you know, rock jetties, I mean, you name it, um, you know, anything like that that's, you know, just going to hold some sort of vegetation, barnacles, um, you know, truthfully, this, the same areas that you're going to find, you know, your your drum and your flounder, really, it's just, you know, just a hard structure. Um, you know, me personally, um, you know, bridge pilings. Um, one thing I like to look at, you know, and things like that, and old docks as well, um, is the things that have been there for years. Um, you know, especially, you know, old bridges, you know, Riceville Beach Bridge, any of these areas, um, you know, those, those bridges aren't new. 
Um, you know, so they've got years and years of, you know, barnacle growth and vegetation and things like that. And, you know, that's, that's the areas where those shoots that are going to hold, you know, that's the stuff they're feeding on. Um, you know, so that's the one thing I like to look for. And, you know, docks as well. Um, you know, if it's some kind of new structure, is this just, you know, being installed or the boat dock or whatever it may be, um, you know, you kind of got to steer away from those areas, you know, even if they have, you know, a little bit of barnacles and things growing on them, it's just not quite enough. Um, you know, so that's that's a, a big thing to me, and, and oyster bars as well. Um, you know, if you've got oysters, you know that are three or four inches. You know, they're those are good mature oysters. I mean, they're they're going to hold, you know, these sheep's head. Um, I think that's some a mistake some people make. Um, you know, is just going to a regular old dock, or you know, maybe a new bridge construction or something like that, or you know, just fishing pilings that you know may not have any kind of old you know vegetation on it, barnacles, whatever. Um, and I think that is just a huge key factor to me. Um, you know, at least locating fish. I mean, if it's, you know, structure like that, that's been there a long time, there's going to be sheep's head on it. You like, uh, this structure to be a minimum of like a certain depth? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I've caught sheep's head from, you know, a foot of water, just like you would, you know, many of your drum or anything like that on into, you know, 15, 20 foot of water. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that do fish deep for them. Um, and I certainly have, um, but, you know, most of my success on sheep's head is usually, you know, kind of in that three to seven or eight foot depth. I mean, usually if I can, you know, get my power poles in the ground, you know, it's it's plenty, you know, plenty of water to hold a sheep's head. Um, you know, certainly in the high, high summer, you know, you do get fish that, you know, get held up a little tighter in deep water. But for the most part, I, I'm fishing pretty shallow for them, really, um, you know, just the same as I would any other, you know, inshore fish. So... It doesn't have to be, because I, I think of the classic bridge fishing for sheep's head, and you mentioned that, so we're, you've tagged that as a spot to catch it, but it doesn't have to be as deep a water as you find. No, um, that's another great question. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, do sheep's head fishing. There, there are certainly fish there, um, but, you know, they'll get out in the main current, you know, the main channel of, you know, whatever body water it is, you know, where it's the deepest. And sure, you know, it certainly does hold sheep's head, but... Um, you know, I found it to be much better, you know, in the shallow water off of the channels. Um, you know, you can feel the bite a little bit better. I know we'll get into that, um, but you don't have as much current. Um, and it seems to me you do have a little bit of a tendency to have more, you know, sea bass and trash fish in the mix of those deeper holes. Um, and I, I, that's why I like the shallow better. It's just much easier to target them, um, really. And I think they hold um, a little bit better in that area, truthfully, because there's more crabs and, you know, other you know, smaller crawly crustaceans um, that are going to be in that shallow water versus, you know, there's a lot of current. So I'm going to ask this question with my audience in mind, or at least my perceived audience in mind, who, again, in my, you know, doesn't have, has a limited amount of chance to get out on the water, you know, to explore, to try what mm -hmm. we're going to talk about here. So before we move into more of like how to fish some of these different structures for that weekend warrior, that guy that has a short window, What's the first piece of structure he should try? Bridge, old dock, oyster bar, jetty rocks? Um, a bridge, without a doubt. Um, you know, and I, I will get into that in a little bit. It'll make sense as far as, you know, how to fish these areas. But um, a bridge, for sure. Um, you know, for beginners, it's really easy. You don't have, um, you know, you're not going to have quite as much current. Um, you're going to be able to fish more straight up and down. Um, you know, fish around boat docks takes a little bit of skill. Um, you know, as far as maneuvering your boat and just, just in general fishing around them, um, you know, usually with the bridges, you're not going to have near as much boat traffic. Um, excuse me, you know, most of the bridges are supposed to be no wake, whether or not people uh, abide by that rule, which usually doesn't happen. But it, it's a it's a great place, you know, for a, a beginner, um, and especially for those reasons is, you know, you're out of the traffic. Um, okay. And it's, it's very predictable. Well, let's use that then as our segue into how to fish. And you've, so let's start with bridges. I mean, since that made the list of like, hey, man, one shot, target a bridge just to yep. get your feet wet with this type of fishing. So tell me a little bit more about how to fish a bridge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and this is something I was going to get into in a little while, but it, it'll flow right into it. Um, you know, just for me, you know, spending a little bit of time with it, you know, you don't have to do this as a beginner. Um, but, you know, on these bridges, I'm going to ride around and, you know, look and <clears throat> see where these fish have been chewing barnacles, you know, on a lower tide. Um, you know, that's made a, a great way for me to kind of find fish. You know, you're certainly going to have sheep's heads scattered about on the bridges, but, um, you know, you might find a more tighter group of fish that are feeding. You know, if you can look at some of these pilings, you know, in the lower 
part of the column when the water's down and you know actually see where they've been feeding how do i see that and i mean i, I can yep. see barnacles but how do i um, see that fish have been feeding on them it will well it will usually be white you know and bare instead of black you know where they've actually chewed off of it um you get a lot of people that show them for sheep's head and i'll get into that in a second as well but um you know outside of them scraping the pylons where it would be totally bare um you'll be able to see pieces of you know white stuff kind of hanging off and, you know, once you actually get a feel for it, I mean, it's pretty obvious of where these fish feed on these pilings. Um, you know, and that's really helped me to find numbers of fish, um, you know, because, I mean, they do move around. But, you know, if you've got one area like that where you can see, okay, these, these sheeps that have been feeding really good right here, they don't really stray away from it, you know, until they're done, you know, with that section of pilings. Um, but, you know, as far as fishing bridges, um, I can't say, you know, tide-wise that it makes all that much of a difference to me. Um you know, high tide, low tide, you know, fall and rise and whatever. It's, it's all fine. Um, they don't, they can be a little bit tide dependent, you know, but for the most part, you know, they, they'll usually feed right on through it. Um, you know, the top of the tide and the very dead low, you know, they slack off like anything. Um, but you know, my typical way of sheep's head, you know, on the bridge, what I'm going to do, um, is, you know, you really want to try to tie off and, you know, get pretty tight to the pylons. Um, you know, that's the, the hardest thing is, get it in and getting your boat tied off to it, um, which is essential, you know, to okay. catch fish in that way, especially for beginners. But, um, you know, I, if the, you know, whichever way the tide's coming, um, you know, I'm fishing a Carolina rig, um, fiddler crabs or whatever. And I know we'll get into that, but, um, you really want to, you know, I try to be on the back side of the pylons from the current, you know, so whichever way the current's coming, you want to be on the back side of that pole, where it's keeping your bait right there in that area. You know, you don't have the current washing it away. And it seems if you're on the upside of it, you know, the current has a tendency to push it into the pylons and you get hung up or your bait's not actually presenting itself well, or, you know, the crabs actually latch onto the pylons and it's just not as easy for the sheep's head to see, um, if that makes sense. But that's an easy way to, you know, to, to get bites. So I'm tying up to the pylon mm -hmm. on the side where the tide is going to pull my boat away from the pylon. Um, well, it, you know, because I didn't quite follow. So, it, you know, in the Riceville Beach area, you know, it, you know, the, the waterway right there runs north and south. So if it's rising, you know, it's going to be you would tie up and let it pull you back into the pylons, you know, where you're you're up tight to. Okay. It. Um, and then from there, that's when you would just want to, you know, fish on the back side of these pylons, just where you're out of the current. Okay. Um, you know, actually hanging your rod out over the boat and being in that area. Okay. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah man, I'm following you now. Yeah. Um, so. Is it legal to tie up to bridges right now? Uh, you know, I know there was a gray area with it uh, quite some time ago, but I've been doing it for a long time, you know, around the Coast Guard and everything. And, you know, I've asked them, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, it's fine. Okay. You know, we don't care. Um, you know, as long as there's no, you know, don't tie off the bridge. Um, you know, if there's any cables that run across, you know, most of the bridges tell you that. Um, but I haven't had any issues with it. And like I said, they told me it was fine, um, you know, because I made sure to ask. Yeah. So I haven't had any trouble with it. Um, and obviously there's lots of people that do it just in general. So, And if I'm tying up on the side where the current, the tide is pushing me towards the pylon, mm -hmm. how am I protecting my boat? There's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, an aluminum boat would be best. All right. <laughs> but obviously nobody. Okay. No, Mark that, Billy. Have a boat you don't care about. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, it's. I've done a couple of different things. You know, I've tied bumpers off directly to the pylons um, and done it that way. Um, there's a lot of people that hang a towel, you know, over mm -hmm. the, over your boat where you tie. Um, and then I've seen people, you know, rig different things with pool noodles. For me, I honestly, I usually hang a towel over the side of the boat. Okay. Um, and it works well, you know, especially if you're in a, you know, a no-wake zone. You don't really have that much to worry about. And, you know, usually when you tie off to it, it'll kind of keep you a little bit slacked off of it. Um but, you know, throwing a towel directly over the side of it, um, right there where your boat may hit in places, um, it seems to work pretty good. Um, but I'm going to throw kind of just in front of it, just a little, maybe maybe a foot or so. Okay. And by the time, you know, you let your slack out and you flip your bail or, you know, whatever you're, whatever type of reel you're using, you're right there in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the fish on the docks, they move around a little bit more. Um, I do think they are a little bit more active um, at times. But, um usually the current will get you where you need to be and kind of the same principle applies you know if you're not getting bites throw in there a little bit farther you know move to a separate set of pylons um you know docks can be a little bit overwhelming to me um just because there's so many 
you know, there's so much and it's all right there packed together. Um, you know, they might be on one pole and not the next. Um, and it does apply to bridges too, but, um, docks, it just seems like they, they do spread out a little bit farther in a way. Um, but it's the same, same concept, you know, move, you know, throw, you know, I'll set my power poles. Obviously some people don't have power poles. You can do this on anchor fine. Um, but you know, I'll get where I can fish four or five pylons Mm -hmm. very easy, you know, right there close and then, you know, switch and go somewhere else. And that bait though is sitting on the bottom. Now we're yep. talking about sitting on the bottom yep. and we're not talking about moving it. We're nope. just letting it sit, yep. I guess, lying on the finger just to help yep. you have a little sensitivity. Yep. Absolutely. Same deal. Keep your line on the thing. Fin- keep your finger on the line. Um, but yeah, you're, you're fishing on the bottom there. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to try to keep it up, um, you know, off of it in that area. And that, that's where I'm saying it, it's a little bit harder when you do get those finicky fish that, you know, are just kind of tapping it and you, you just miss them. Um, it is a little bit harder to do that. Um, but it's a, it's a great way because I mean, the docks do hold a lot of fish and you know, all the, all the boat docks in this area are old. Um, and it's just a, it, you know, it's a great spot to do it. And, um, you know, kind of once you get the feel for the bite, um, it, it's easier to do that that way when you can fish it on the bottom. Um, it makes, you, you see what I'm saying? It just makes yeah. it easier to understand what you're feeling for per se. All right. So now take me to oyster rocks, yep. to an oyster bar, and maybe a little bit more about how I pick out one that would be the viable, like what makes one better looking than another to target, and then how do I target it? <clears throat> yeah, um, good question. The The oyster rocks, to me, are not as predictable, I don't think. Um, I, I do fish them, you know, for sure, you know, especially in, you know, trout season or something like that. You know, you're kind of fishing the same areas, but... Um, you know, it, you're really looking for, for me, if I can find one that's still got a little bit of water on it, you know, maybe the whole thing doesn't, you know, fall out at low tide. It's still halfway covered or something like that. But, you know, if it's got two, three, four foot of water on it, you know, at high tide, um, yes, it's plenty, it's got plenty of water to hold a fish. Um, the oyster rocks to me though, it just seems as, you know, these fish, they move around a little bit more, you know, because, you know, at low tide, they, they're not going to have much water. Um, so they don't as consistently stay on, you know, it's hard to go to one particular oyster bar every time and catch a sheep set off of it, if that makes sense. Um, you know, you may end up, you know, coming across black drum in the process and you're going to catch a lot of black drum sheep set fishing just in general. Um, but I, I really haven't found, you know, a good way to tell you which one's better okay. than the next. Um, it's kind of just, you know, you just try it. Um, you know, the, the oyster part of it is, is much faster to me. Um, I'm going to go sit there five, 10 minutes and go, you know, cause most of your oyster bars aren't huge, not in this area. Um, you know, so if, if there's a sheep's head there and he's hungry, it's going to be pretty quick. Um, you know, and the same deal, most of my oyster bar fishing is 10 minutes and okay. I'm, I'm gone. You know, I'm going to go somewhere else. You know, you can certainly outstay your welcome on that quick. So how do I, how do I position myself? How do I present, how do I position the boat? How do I present yep. the bait? Um, you know, if you've got a spot lock on your trolling motor, that's great. Um, obviously some people aren't going to have those things. So, you know, you would just anchor, um, you know, and get as close to it as you can. Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, you know, I've had some success with a cork and live shrimp, um, mm-hmm. over top of the oyster bars. Um, you know, and I would, what I would want to do, um, on that is, you know, set it where it's, you know, about a foot or so off the oyster. Cause you know, they'll, they'll they will swim up for it. Um, you know, if you were going to fish live shrimp, but it's not something I typically do, um, just because, you know, you're trash fish and pin fish and stuff, at least in this area. Right. Um, but outside of that same deal, the Carolina rig, um, if you can get directly over top of an oyster bar, um, you know, actually float over it, you know, whether it's your anchor or whatever. Um, and you would do, do the same concept as a bridge. Um, I wouldn't want to drop it to the bottom if I can help it, you know, you're liable to get hung up. Um, but you know, you're just going to float it just over it. Um, really the exact same way you would do bridge fishing. Obviously you don't have a pylon to be behind. Um, so two to four feet, I can, I'm not going to spook that fish if I'm right over top of the rock and four feet of water. Not really. Um, you know, I catch a lot of, a lot of sheep's head in shallow water, you know, when I'm three or four foot away from them, um, you know, they really don't spook as easy as some of your other fish, you know, now if the water's crystal clear and you can see the bottom, you know, I wouldn't waste my time with it, but, um, they really don't, um, not like drum or anything else does. I mean, you, you can get r- incredibly close to these fish and that's something I was going to get into, you know, 
when the high tide, you know, gets up, the fish will actually come all the way up to the top of the water column um, and start feeding. And you can see them on these bridges. And typically they don't bite all that well. Um, when that happens, usually if I can see fish, I'm, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go on and do something else for a little bit and let the tide change or whatever. But you could, if they wouldn't swim away, you could scoop them with your net. I mean, they don't, they're not scared of you in the slightest and stuff like that. It's actually pretty, pretty crazy every year when I go flounder fish or whatever, I'm around structure like that. I say, I'm going to take a, you know, a harpoon or something and just gig it, whatever. Cause, but no, they, they really won't spook. Um, huh. you know, if you get in there and you're doing jumping jacks on the front of the boat and something like that and, you know, blaring kid rock, they're probably going to go out of there. But for the most part, you deal can breaker, it. Billy. Uh, he, he likes to I like it rock yeah yeah he jumps ropes I mean he likes it all <laughs> hey man you never know try it they might bite <laughs> it hasn't worked for you're me too yet, kind. But, yeah. no Luke you're too kind yeah. we're, I, I we're just bashing want, Billy right now we're I, not trying to make him feel better I didn't, I didn't want him to catch fish in my hole so I was just telling him to do that anyways <laughs> that's Fair what enough. I was going for so with an oyster rock so is it it's more straight over top, so it's not mm-hmm. on the back side of the tide or the front side of the tide. It's if ideally it's up and down and it's right over top of it. Yep, yep. For the most part, I mean, you can kind of move around it a little bit. You know, maybe you certainly can try. The, you know, the upside, the downside, right side, left side, or whatever. Um, you know, it's not super crazy. I mean, at least at least the oyster rocks in this area. You know, they're more of a hump and they're just not. You know, they're not a lot of real estate. You know, to fish. So, you know, usually if there's one there, he's going to find it. You know, pretty quick. Well, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do, man. I'm going to ask you if there's anything new we should think of if we want to try some jetty rocks. And then I think I'm going to have you talk a little bit more about bait. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the rock jetties are great. Um, you know, it's kind of the, the same way as docks or any of the other, you know, I would fish it. Um, you know, obviously you don't have, you know, the current per se, like you would on a dock or something like that. Um, but still same deal, Carolina rig, um, you know, I'm going to throw, I'm going to be on the up current side and throw down into it, you know, so it keeps it tight. Um, the thing I don't like about fishing the jetties is you do get hung up, um, you know, significantly. And that's part of it. You know, if you're sheepshead fishing and you're not outside of being on the back side of the pile and even then, you know, if you're not getting hung up and breaking, breaking rigs, you're not really in the fish, you know, so it's part of it. You know, if you're breaking off, um, that's kind of the uh, great advice I can give somebody. If you're if you're in five, six foot of water or whatever, and you're, you're breaking off on something that you can't see, there's probably a sheep set there. Um, you know, if it's old, you know, structure or whatever, but same deal on the rock jetties. Um, I would fish it just like I would a boat dock. Um, you know, for the most part, just throw and, you know, let my, let the current take it away where I can keep good tension on the rod. Um, you know, feel that bite a little bit better. Um, that's how I do it. It's It's really not much different than fishing boat docks. How are you setting that drag? Lock it down. Lock it down. I do. All right. Um, it just, you know, it's, uh, you know, and I'm speaking on this as a more of a charter base. Um, you know, I, I definitely lock it down, um, you know, so they can at least, you know, have a chance to get that fish out. You know, if you hook a seven, eight, 10 pound sheep's head, it can still get drag out if it wants to, but you know, you, you just got a better chance of getting it out. I've lost a lot of fish by, I kind of learned that the hard way, I guess I would let my drag be a little bit too loose. Um, they go away from the pile and hang a right, hang a left, and you know you're you're wrapped up like a Christmas tree. What's the uh, main way that clients lose a fish? Like if they get the hook up, what's the main breaking it off? Just breaking getting, it off, getting it on the pile. You know it. You know, like I said, it it turns or goes one way or the other and hits that pile, and then it'll cut it. Um, you know, and I have it, it's preference. You know, you can certainly fish your drag loose. Um, you know, this is just what I found for me that's worked all these years, um, you know, is having it locked down tight. But most of the time, that's what it is. You know, they're not, you know, I guess not expecting it because it is overwhelming. You know, you <clears throat> you might feel the tiniest little bite in the world and you set the hook and it's a 10-pound fish. And you know what I mean? You're just not expecting it. So that's usually what happens. You know, it gets them on the jump. They're like, oh, I think I got something. Pop. You know. So let's say you and I go sheep's head fishing and let's say I just consistently lose bait. Like I am missing bites and I'm starting to, I'm starting to freak out mm-hmm. and you got to calm me down and you got to give me some advice. Yep. What is, don't worry about calming me down, but what would be the advice? Cause if I say what, give me, tell me something. All I'm doing is losing bait. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you that's going to happen. All right. Um, I would bet my paycheck on it. Um, 
but it just it just comes with time um you know it, you know that's when i would really harp on you know the slow down you know raise your rod tip up really slow come about a foot you know drop it down to the bottom and just slowly just slowly do that and eventually you're you're going to get that bite that you're going to understand you know what you've been waiting for the whole time um and that happens a lot um it just kind of is the, the nature of sheep's head fishing um but you know it's just slow down and, and really you know be tense and you know try to feel e- anything um you know that's really the great you know the only advice i can give somebody when that happens you know if anything feels weird you know if it feels like a fly lands on the line you know set the hook All right. um you know, you're better off to set the hook than not, truthfully. Um, you know, most of the time people are like, I think I had a bite. Yeah, it's gone. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's gone. You know, go ahead and reel it in and check it. But um, that's it. Just, just slow down and really try to pay attention to what you're feeling for. Um, you know, just, just if you keep your rod moving, you know, and I don't mean, you know, like up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, but just slow, steady, up and downs. Um, you know, you can get fast on your down. That doesn't matter. It's just the up part is is really crucial um to help you feel that bite okay all right now talk to me about bait okay um obviously the number one easiest thing for anybody to get i mean you can buy them at most tackle shops now you know is fiddler crabs um i use a lot of them um you know they they work great um you know you can hook them a couple of different ways it truthfully it doesn't really matter um but usually when i do it i i've any kind of crabs and i'm just gonna it's gonna be hard for me to describe it to you i guess without seeing it um but i would want to take my hook and actually stick it in the crab's side like right where his little legs are just stick it right there in the crab's legs per se and don't expose the hook and that way it kind of keeps that crab um you know in the water column you know just kind of fluttering like it would naturally in a way um you know and especially when you at least i've found when you put the hook all the way through you know any kind of whatever you're fishing on the crustaceans, you know, obviously you've made another weak point in the okay. shell and, you know, those fish will, it's easier for them to just come and barely crunch it and the whole crab falls apart. But if you just stick it in, in the crab anywhere really, and actually don't expose it, it doesn't make another weak point in the shell where they can just incredibly easy crunch it and it fall apart. Um, but anyway, so yeah, fiddler crabs, um, you know, so go in the side, it doesn't have to be like a leg cavity or whatever just, just somewhere on the it, side stick it in the crab and yep. hook not exposed yep. just in and then stay in the crab yep absolutely bigger fiddlers catch bigger fish or i i haven't found that it makes a difference i've caught big sheep set on little bitty bait i've caught big sheep set on big bait you okay. know um obviously i wouldn't want to use like a ladybug size bait but it really doesn't matter right. truthfully um what else know, they'll eat anything but um Sea urchins um, is a great one. A lot of people don't use them. Um, they're a little bit tricky to get. You know, it's got to be usually really low water. Um, the bridges are full of them. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen sea urchins before mm-hmm. or used them. Um, I've never used them. I've certainly seen them. There's, there's two ways to fish them. Um, one of them is going to get you a big one. The other one is going to get you, you know, a small fish or a big fish. But... Um, what I do is take them, you know, cut the spines off of them, you know, the pair of pliers or whatever. Um, and you can actually crunch it all the way down to you just have what, you know, looks like a rock or whatever. All right. And then that I would just, that's when I would use a big, you know, like four alt or something like that. Um, and, you know, hook it that way. Just, just hook, you can expose it all the way there. It's just such a big bait. It's going to be. All the spines off. Yep. Totally bare. Um, best you can. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll, they'll still eat it, but, um, you know, and do that. And that's something that's when you're doing that when you're fishing the whole ocean like that you're really targeting a big fish um you know the the little ones aren't aren't going to mess with it i mean it's going to be you know probably seven pounds or better usually um but i would do that um and then also you can take the urchin you know cut all the spines most of them off where you can handle it easy um and if you flip it over there's a soft spot in there and you can you know break around it and on the inside of it it's what looks like a big white barnacle um you know it's i don't really have a reference point for you but i mean it's obvious what it, i mean it really does look like a just a giant white barnacle and that's another thing that i like to use um you know if i don't know if there's any big fish or they're biting kind of finicky um i'll use those um and kind of the same way i don't expose it you really just kind of stick it on your hook and just float it um but fishing it you know the exact same way so really there, there's two ways to fish you know those sea urchins um you know one of them is going to get you more consistent bites the other one's just fishing for for big fish 
Okay. And there's one white barnacle-ish inside of yep. there. So each sea urchin is basically one bait, whether I'm right. rigging the big boy or the inside boy. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's right. Um, and like I said, you know, you got to find them on, you know, the, the lower part of the water. Um, you know, they're usually on pylons. Um, and they come off pretty easy. I just go around on my trolling motor, you know, even if you just tie off to it. And I just take a net and scoop them off. Okay. Um, they're, they're pretty easy to get. Um, you know, that's another bait I like to use a lot. Um, you know, it's just they're a little bit more of a pain to deal with. Um, obviously cause you got to scoop them and cut them and everything, but, yeah. um, they certainly weren't good. Um, you know, if I was, if it was a slower day, I don't know that I would recommend using the whole urchin, you know, I'd use the, the little feller on the inside. Anything else? Uh, yep. There's actually, I'll actually just scrape off, you know, the barnacles and the clams. It's got the little vegetation and stuff that you actually see growing on the pylons in the lower part of the column. Um, you know, I'll actually scrape those off. Um, you know, whatever you got a putty knife or, you know, a fish ruler, um, anything like that, you can, you know, I've done that more, you know, and on a day when the sheep set are biting, I've run out of bait and I don't want to leave. Um, and that's actually what they're, you know, a lot of times feeding on. Um, even if it's got that, you know, pieces of grass or seaweed or whatever in it, I mean, they, they eat that. Um, so I will scrape those off. I mean, especially if I get to these, you know, these places at low water, you know, to start with, I'll immediately go ahead and scrape that off. Um, and use it and you know it's it's a little bit tricky um because it does fall apart um relatively easy um but you know if you get a you know a clump clump of it off you know maybe a 50 cent piece size quarter size you don't need much um and i all i really do on that is just just kind of find a cavity you know where your hook can actually go through it um obviously you're not actually hooking it into the the muscle itself it's just more so hanging on there you know because they're real clumped together um but that's something else I really like to use. And I mean, 99% of the time when you clean sheep's head, that's what's inside them. Gotcha. Um, it's just a little bit harder to use as bait. Um, really, it falls off easy and things like that. But I mean, they, that's, that is their main diet in these areas. So that's a, you know, I mean, it almost seems ignorant to use something other than that. But, you know, sometimes you can't always get it. Yeah. Man, this has been fantastic. Um, I think we're basically at the end of our time. So I'm going to ask you one you know, anything that you'd like to get out that I didn't set you up via a question. And then, and then from that, I'm going to ask you, Luke Moser, you're more than a sheep's head fisherman. Tell our audience what else you're targeting throughout the year. Give them the quick highlight reel. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, really the, and this may help uh, Billy out for your question later, but the, the main thing I can harp on, you know, bridge fishing is moving your rod, you know, constantly, slowly up, slowly down. I mean, it tremendously, increases your chance to you know actually feel the bite um you know it took me a, a little while to learn that um but it is incredibly important important it's going to get you you know more fish in the cooler billy can't use that as his best oh, takeaway. sorry billy sorry the other guy um but the yeah so a little bit of everything um you know drum and trout kind of through the winter drum and trout in the spring sheep's head flounder i mean flounder was flounder and sheep's head are probably my two favorite obviously the flounder thing's a little bit tricky this year but um you know, trolling for Spanish kings, really, really anything inshore, near shore. Um, okay. But I would, I would definitely say sheep's head and you know and flounder, are my my two favorite things. But you know, obviously drum, um, you know black drum in the winter time around here. A um, little bit of everything, really. I mean, try to try to keep it keep it changed up and keep it moving. Yeah, follow the seasons yep. right on. Luke Moser, thank you so much. Yeah, man, thank this you for having me. This has been great. I'm hot. I'm hot for sheep's head yeah. right now, Billy. All right, let's go. What? No, no, nobody else? All right. I'm just by myself. I'm just pumped all by myself. Billy, <laughs> the best takeaway is to keep that rod moving, but yes. that cannot be your best takeaway. That was my, let me see, what is my best takeaway? I mean, I guess I learned that sheep's head don't like Kid Rock or Jumping Jacks. <laughs> Theoretically, we I haven't like, proved that. I like to do Jumping Jacks on the boat when I'm fishing, so. I can tell. Oh, man. So many good takeaways. So many good ones. Um, I don't that. even know. What's that? He got that burn. Oh. I can tell you like doing jumping jacks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can. I'm actually hungry. <laughs> Are we finished with this yet? <laughs> Whatever. Now I'm not doing this ever again, Gary. <laughs> Find a new co-host to pick on. <laughs> Billy, tell, my, tell our people how to watch, how to listen. Oh, they already know how. They're listening and watching. No, I'm just kidding. So here we go. We're on, available on Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, 
uh, Google Podcasts and also available on YouTube. And just make sure that you like and subscribe, comment, share, all that. Um, all those algorithms love that, and it helps us move up in the rankings uh, to become, uh, you know, whatever. And if you like it, leave us a leave us a comment, leave us a, a sub, you know subscription, whatever. No, don't leave us a subscription. Subscribe. <laughs> no, don't do that. Whatever. Subscribe. I, I know it's through podcasting for a living. It's not a big deal. <laughs> and you can tell your comments to Gary or the other guy. Or the other guy. Yeah. Please don't don't call me Billy. Don't do that. Uh, Sheep's head name was Billy. I got that reference. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, he's smooth. That was smooth. Yeah, good job, man. Marine Warehouse Center. They're the best. They're the bomb. We love them. We love them. They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to go over there and buy all their boats one day. We are. <laughs> all of them. And give them away like Oprah. You get a boat. You get a boat. <laughs> you get a boat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So love those guys. So go over there and check them out. Uh, they do a lot of different things, obviously, as we saw in the video. Um, and then, yeah, Gary, that's it, man. What a great episode. Send us your photos. Send us your videos. A great episode. It's a perfect episode. Awesome. We'll see you next week, man. Bye, guys.